Well, again, good morning to all of you. Uh, before we come and consider God's word, uh, let's come to a time of prayer. Let's pray for his help. Our Father in heaven, indeed, this is uh, a privilege to be able to uh, listen to your word preach, and we do pray that your spirit will be among us, working in our hearts, granting us humble hearts to be able to discern and understand uh, truths from your word. And may indeed these truths apply in our everyday lives. For all this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, please turn your Bibles with me to Ephesians. The book of Ephesians chapter 5. A series which uh, I've been doing for a long time now. Uh, believe it or not, since 2018. Uh, anyway, we shall go through this uh, series slowly. Uh, today is Ephesians chapter 5, and today we are looking at verse 18, verse 18 of Ephesians chapter 5. But first let me read uh, from verse 18 until 21, right? although we are only looking at verse 18. I'll read from verse 18 until verse 21. And do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, or in some of you using the ESV in which is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always and for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of the Lord. Now, by way of introduction, we first uh, want to lay out the heart of the text. Now, let me first lay out for you the heart of the text. What is the main point? What is the heart of the text uh, in this portion of Scripture, in these few verses that we have just read? Uh, many things are mentioned from verse 18 to 21. In verse 18, you saw it says, do not be drunk with wine. In verse 19, you see there is the speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, and there is singing. Verse 20, there is giving thanks. In verse 21, there is a submitting to one another. And many things said in these few verses, but what is the heart of the message? Well, although there are many things mentioned here, the Main point is only one, and the heart of the text is found in the second part of verse 18. The second half of verse 18, which is, be filled with the Spirit. This is the heart of the text. Be filled with the Spirit. Now, the subsequent verses, verse 19 to 21, contain the marks of someone who is filled with the Spirit. Or in other words, uh, these verses contain the descriptions or manifestations of a person who is filled with the Spirit. This is how someone acts or how someone lives when he or she is filled with the Spirit. Now, this is not a complete list of all the marks that is of someone who is filled with the Spirit, but they are still vital uh, marks of a Spirit-filled person. Now, although we are not considering verse 19 to 21 this morning, uh, throughout the message, I will still uh, try my best to highlight the marks of a spirit-filled person. Now, back to verse 18, which is, for today's sermon, our only focus. Verse 18. And in today's sermon, uh, there are only two parts. First, I shall deal with the verse as a whole. And in that, we will look at the contrast in this verse. We will look at the contrast in this verse, and in the second part, I shall deal with the positive command, which is the second half of this verse, the positive command. I say positive command because there is also a negative command here, which is do not be drunk with wine, but in the second part, I shall deal with the positive command, which is to be filled with the Spirit. Okay, so firstly, we come to look at the verse as a whole which is the contrast. Do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, but, you see the contrast, but be filled with the Spirit. Now, I think the most natural question one can ask here when you read this verse is, 
Why does Paul put wine and spirit together? Why does Paul put drunkenness with wine and filled with the spirit together? Why not, Paul say, do not be angry, but be filled with the spirit? Or why not say, do not steal, but be filled with the spirit? Well, I think Paul has good reasons to put wine and spirit here together like this. I think one reason is because they are, even though it's a contrast, there are certain similarities. There are certain similarities between these two uh, illustrations. There is a degree of similarity between being drunk with wine and being filled with the Spirit. Now, I'm not saying they're exactly the same, but there is an element of similarity. In fact, some people in Acts 2 thought they were the same thing. If I can show you in Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 2 verse 4, Acts chapter 2 verse 4, it says, uh, and, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So here in Acts chapter 2, we have the disciples being filled with the Spirit. They are under the influence of the Holy Spirit and as a result, they were able to speak in tongues that is in other languages. And then you go down to verse 12 and 13. So they were all amazed and perplexed, saying, one, saying to one another, whatever could this mean? And others mocking said, they are full of new wine. You see, some people here thought uh, these apostles, although they were filled with the Spirit, they thought they were filled with wine. They thought that the disciples were under the influence of alcohol. But in reality, the disciples were under the influence of the Holy Spirit. You see, there are some people made the right observation, but had, they had the wrong diagnosis. And so here you get the sense, at least on the surface, there is some similarity. And here you see the similarity is influence. Right? The similarity is influence. Now let's consider another similarity. And while doing so, we try to make the right observations and diagnosis. Consider this. Being drunk with wine and being filled with the Spirit both emboldens a person. It both emboldens a person. In other words, it makes someone brave. I believe you have seen this scenario before. Right? At a wedding feast, uh, everybody is there and at the start of the, the wedding banquet, everybody is shy and timid and, and uh, uh, rather quiet. The whole occasion seems to be rather dull. But after a while, when people start drinking some alcohol, the tongues become a bit loose, the mind becomes a bit haywire, and everybody starts yam singing everywhere, everybody suddenly becomes best friends, and the whole occasion becomes very noisy. Suddenly, everybody is so bold uh, with one another. I remember even one time, my wife was telling me about uh, her, story, her, her experience. Uh, she was at a wedding, and her friend was supposed to give a speech, and she was so nervous to give a speech during the wedding, she had to drink some alcohol. And after drinking some alcohol, she was so bold uh, to go up to give a speech on stage. But of course, what came out of her mouth was all uh, utter rubbish. Right? So drunk people look bold on the outside. But in reality, they are just simply beyond themselves. They have just lost sense of themselves. In fact, some become bold to the point of no shame. You'll be amazed the crazy things that people do when they are drunk with wine. Boldness to the point of shamelessness. Now, if we are to be truly bold, may I encourage you to be bold in the spirit. Boldness is one of the marks of a spirit-filled person. Bonus is one of the marks of a spirit-filled person. How do I know this? Look at Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4 and verse 8. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them. See, here we have Peter being filled with the Holy Spirit. And he, John was with him as well, were addressing the rulers and elders of Israel. And after Peter was done, in verse 13, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, 
they, and perceived that they were uneducated, untrained men, they marveled. You see here, Peter and John were bold because they were spirit-filled men. Spirit-filled men were, who were bold and courageous. Now you look further down in the same chapter of Acts, verse 29. Now, Lord, look on their threats and grant to your servants with, that with all bonus they may speak your words. Now the other disciples, the companions of Peter and John, they were also facing the reality of threats and persecution. And they were afraid. They were scared. And they needed help. And what did they do? They prayed for bonus in verse 31. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they spoke the word of God with bonus. What did they do? They prayed. What happened after they prayed? They were filled with the Spirit. And what is the result of being filled with the Spirit? They spoke the word of God with bonus. It takes bonus and courage to speak the word of God faithfully. And if we are to be bold, let us be bold in the Spirit, not by alcohol. We need the help of the Spirit. We need to be filled with the Spirit. Let me share one more similarity, and that is comfort and joy. It seems to me that there are people who seek comfort and joy in alcohol. In their sorrows, in their trials of life, when they face hardship, many people turn to alcohol. They turn to wine. They go to the bar for drinks. They want to drown their sorrows in alcohol. They think that there is a place where they can find joy and happiness. I suppose that's why sometimes the bar outside, you see the word happy hour. Right? For them, there is a place where they can find joy. And I know in, in, in my work environment, I've seen architects and engineers so stressed in their work. After a hard day, either with the clients or with their bosses, at the end of the day, they rather go to the bar instead of go home. Why? Because they want to drown out all their stress with alcohol. They want to drown out all their hardships with wine. I think instead of happy hour, the correct name should be artificial joy. Now, drunk people, aren't, I don't think they are truly happy. I think what the alcohol does is help them temporarily forget their sorrows, forget their troubles. The next day when they become sober again, they are back to their original state. Now, if you want true joy, peace, and comfort, may I recommend you to be filled with the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is our true comforter. Let me read John 14 verse 16 for you. John 14 verse 16, I will pray the Father and he will give you another helper or comforter that he might abide with you forever. In Acts 13, 52, the disciples were filled with joy and the Holy Spirit. Galatians 5, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. You see, another mark of being filled with the Spirit is joy and peace. When you face trials and hardships in your life, when you face troubles in your life, do not go looking for alcohol or wine. Do not seek to be drunk, to drown out all your sorrows. If you want true joy and peace, may I recommend to you to be filled with the Spirit. Now, carnal men seek alcohol to, to be drunk, to find joy. But Christians find joy as they are filled with the Spirit. Now, as much as there are similarities between being drunk with wine and being filled with the Spirit, at the end of the day, these two things are contrasts. They are a world of difference between these two. And the verse itself uh, tells us that. The verse itself, that in Ephesians 5, contrasts drunkenness and being filled with the Spirit. That's why Paul says, 
to be, Paul did not say to be filled with the Spirit as you are drunk with wine. He says, do not be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. And so the verse itself tells us that at the end of the day, this is still a contrast. Now, in what way are they so different? Well, for one, drunkenness, drunkenness makes people foolish. Right? Under the influence of alcohol, people will say weird stuff. People say things that are foolish. Under the influence of alcohol, they get carried away and they act foolishly. And very often, they commit vile sins. But spirit-filled people are wise people. Spirit-filled Christians are wise in their speech, in their conduct, in their everyday lives, in their usage of time, and in their usage of finance, finances. Wisdom is a mark of a spirit-filled people, a spirit-filled person as well. Acts 6, verse 3. When the disciples were instructed to seek out men to take care of the widows, it says, Seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. Drunkenness causes contention, but spirit-filled people are gentle and submissive. When the person is under the influence of alcohol, he loses his emotions. And sometimes a harmless command can even become an insult to him. And sometimes you see fights breaking out in drinking bars. Spirit-filled Christians are gentle and submissive. Galatians 5, the fruit of the Spirit is gentleness, self-control. Ephesians 5, 21, submitting to one another in the fear of the Lord. Wives submit to their husbands in the Lord. Workers submit to their husbands, uh, to their masters in the Lord. Children submitting to their parents in the Lord. Drunkenness wastes time. Spirit-filled Christians redeem the time in Ephesians 5. Drunkenness does not satisfy. The more you drink, the more thirsty you become. Spirit-filled Christians are truly filled. They are content. Drunkenness exposes people to danger. Spirit-filled Christians put on the whole armor of God and are protected against the wiles of the devil. Now, I know that despite all these examples, there are still people who will want to challenge me because they enjoy their wine very much and they even more enjoy the thrills of getting drunk once in a while. They will argue with me that sometimes mm, I'm not that drunk, but I'm just a bit tipsy and that's fine. Well, let me show you one more last contrast which is not debatable in scripture. And the last contrast is this. Being drunk, being drunk with wine is a sin and must be avoided. Being filled with the Spirit is a command from God and must be pursued. Notice that I mentioned being drunk with wine is a sin. I did not say that drinking wine is a sin. The verse, that, the verse itself says drunkenness, which implies that there is a lawful use of wine. Even in 1 Timothy 5, if you are familiar with the passage, Paul instructs Timothy uh, to use a bit of wine for his stomach illness. However, the Bible warns strictly against the sin of drunkenness. The Bible warns strictly against the sin of drunkenness. I read three verses to you. The first one, Isaiah 5, 22. Woe to men mighty at drinking wine. Woe to men valiant for mixing intoxicating drink. Proverbs 23, 21. For the drunkard, and gluten will come to poverty. Drowsiness will clothe a man with rags. And Galatians 5.21, I think this is the strongest verse here on drunkenness. Five, Galatians 5.21, Envy murders drunkenness, rivalries. Those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. You think drunkenness is okay? Those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Drunkenness is always associated with calamity, with shamelessness, with sin, and with eternal damnation. You remember Noah was drunk and he was naked shamelessly. Lot was drunk and he committed shameless acts with his daughters. 
the Corinthian church was drunk and they profaned the Lord's table. Drunkenness is a serious sin and must be avoided at all costs. Now, if we look at the comparison between being drunk with wine and being filled with the Spirit, these two things are worlds apart. And now in the second half of the sermon, I wish to draw your attention to the heart of the text that is to be filled with the Word of God. Again, I read the verse, Do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Now, what does it mean to be filled with the Spirit? Well, firstly, being filled with the Spirit, let us be clear that it is not the same as being indwelled with the Spirit. Now, we must differentiate between the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and the filling of the Holy Spirit. Now, all Christians are indwelled by the Holy Spirit, but not all Christians are equally filled with the Holy Spirit. The Bible never commands us to be indwelled by the Holy Spirit, but the Bible does command us to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Romans chapter 8, verse 9, it says, But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. So in other words, if you are a Christian, if you belong to Christ, if you are a child of God, you have the Spirit, the Holy Spirit that is indwelling in you. And if you are not a Christian, the Holy Spirit does not indwell in you. And if the Spirit indwells in you, it stays with you until you die. You are sealed by the Spirit until you die, until the day of redemption, until Christ comes again. Now, the Spirit doesn't come in and out every other day. It's not like Monday come in, Tuesday go out. If you're indwelt by the Spirit, you are sealed until the day of redemption. Now, when the Spirit indwells a, a believer, it is permanent. Now, although all Christians are indwelt by the Spirit, not all Christians will be filled by the Spirit in the same degree. Some will be more, some will be less. So, th th that's the point I'm trying to make. The, the, these two things are different. The indwelling of the Spirit and the filling of the Spirit. Now, with that, we focus our attention now to the filling of the Spirit. Now, the word fill uh, in the original Greek is a pretty hard word to translate. Uh, in the word, the word field in the original Greek was written in the present imperative passive tense. And the word field in the original Greek was written in the present imperative and passive tense. Now, when I say imperative, I mean that this is a command. A command means that this is a responsibility, something that you must do. To be filled with the Spirit is a command, it's your responsibility, something you must do. Now, present tense means that this is to be done continually. So when the instruction is given to be filled with the Spirit, this is something to be done continually for the rest of your life. The well, indwelling of the Spirit is something that happens once. The Spirit just comes in and it seals you until the day of redemption. Imperative, present, and passive. Passive means this is something done to you. It means that this is something done to you. You cannot fill yourselves, we cannot fill ourselves with the Holy Spirit. But we can be filled by the Spirit. Now you see how complicated this is. This is not an easy uh, word to translate from the original Greek. It means we are to be doing something that we may be filled with the Spirit, to put it all together. We must be doing something that we may be filled with the Spirit because this is a command to be done continually. At the same time, it is passive because we cannot do it to ourselves. To translate it more literally, it can be read as do not be drunk with wine for a dissipation, but be being kept filled with the Spirit. Be being kept filled with the Spirit. You see how difficult it is to translate this. 
You cannot fill yourself, but you can be filled. And this is a command that we must be aware. Now, I want to look deeper still at the meaning, uh, at, at the word fill, at the meaning of the word fill. Now, the word fill can be used to describe something that is literally being filled up. Right? You take a glass of a, a glass and then you have a jar of water and you fill up the glass with water. Fill. Literally fill up. Uh, Matthew 13, verse 48, you know, the, the drag net, the fishing net was filled, filled up with fishes. Uh, there's a sense of how you use the word fill there. But for this verse here, that is not what Paul was intending to say. Paul doesn't want us to be filled up. He wants us to be filled through. He doesn't want us to be filled up like how you fill up a glass of water. He wants us to be filled through. For example, you think of the wind that fills the sails of a boat. You know, some boats, uh, not all boats are run by motor power. Some boats, you have to pull up the sails and then the sails catch the wind and the wind fills it through and pushes the boat along the sea. The wind just dominates the boat and it moves it across the sea or the ocean. Now, this is what Paul intends to happen to us. Just as the boat is moved by the wind, he wants us to be moved, to be dominated, to be controlled, to be influenced by the Holy Spirit. This is the intention of Paul here when he uses the word to be filled by the Spirit. The word filled here is used similarly with the same idea in Luke chapter 6, verse 11. Filled with rage. You have the Pharisees here in Luke 6, filled with rage. They are so dominated by this emotion. The emotion of rage just fill, fills them up. John 16, verse 6, here you have the disciples filled with sorrow. Luke 5, 26, the people saw Jesus heal the paralytic and they were filled with fear. All these have the same idea and same meaning. Paul commands here is he wants us to be dominated, influenced, permeated by the Holy Spirit. He wants the Spirit's influence in our lives. And this is what this verse here is saying. Being filled with the Spirit means that the Holy Spirit is working in us. The Holy Spirit is working in us. Or in simpler terms, we are under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Do not be under the influence of alcohol, but be under the influence of the Holy Spirit. And the more we are filled by the Spirit, the more intense is the Spirit's work in our lives, in our inner man, the more Christian graces are shown in our lives. Now we have seen the meaning of this verse, to be filled with the Spirit, that is to be influenced by the Spirit. The obvious question now is how? How can we be filled with the Spirit? How can we be filled with the Spirit? Let me first say that this question is not for the unbelievers. Only Christians can be filled with the Spirit. Unbelievers who do not have the Spirit indwelling in them have no business wanting to be filled with the Spirit. For those of you who are unbelievers, your first responsibility is to repent from your sins and believe in Christ for salvation. You cannot say that I don't want Christ, but I want the Spirit to fill me. You cannot say that. You cannot hug on and hold to your sins, and at the same time, you desire the Holy Spirit to fill you and influence you. On that same note to the believers, for those of you who have pledged your life to Christ, you also cannot hug on to your sins and you want Christ and you want the Spirit to fill you and influence you. If you want to be filled with the Spirit, you must mortify your sins. That's exactly what the verse here is saying. Do not be drunk with wine. Do not let this sin of drunkenness take control of your life. You must mortify it. 
Do not be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. If you want the Holy Spirit to fill you and influence your life, you must mortify your sin. You cannot hug your sin, and at the same time, you also want the Holy Spirit to be in you. Secondly, if you want to be filled with the Spirit, you must let the Word of God dwell in you richly. I read the parallel, ver parallel verse in Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. It says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another in some hymns, spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Now, do you see the similarity here in verse 16 and 17, comparing back to what we have just read in Ephesians 5, 19 and 20? There is speaking to one another in psalms, hymns and spiritual songs. There is the giving thanks to God always and for all things. The manifestations is the same, and so the commands are related. Being Letting the word of Christ dwell in you richly is related to being filled with the Spirit. If you want the Spirit to work in you, to influence you in your life, you must let the word of God dwell in you richly. It's not going to happen mystically. It's not going to happen by you meditating on a mountain, emptying your mind. If you want the, word, if you want the Spirit to dwell and to, to influence your life, you must let the Word of God, the Word of Christ, dwell in you richly. And lastly, if you want to be filled with the Spirit, pray for it. If you want to be filled with the Spirit, pray for it. Luke 11 verse 13, it says that if you then being evil know how to give good things to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Ephesians 3 verse 16, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his Spirit in the inner man. And down three verses down, in verse 19 of chapter 3 of Ephesians, it says that you may be filled with the fullness of God. If you so desire the Spirit to fill you, to work in your life, to influence you, pray. Pray that God the Father will send His Spirit to work in you, that Christian graces may be evident in your life. By way of application, concerning this verse, I hope to warn you about uh, two extremes when it comes to the matter of being filled with the Spirit. Now, the first one is strange fire or profane fire. Now, in, prep in preparation for this sermon, I took some time to re-watch some of the strange fire conference conducted by jo uh, John MacArthur's church uh, to see again, to remind myself the horrendous things that are happening in the charismatic circle. You see how they conduct their worship. You see how they take this word, be filled with the Spirit, mean. I didn't make up these words myself. Strange fire is found in Leviticus chapter 10. Leviticus chapter 10, verse 1 to 3. Then Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and put fire in it, put incense in it, and offered profane fire or strange fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. So fire went out from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. Our God had given Israel and the priest's instruction as to how they were to approach him. But Aaron's two sons, Nebab and Abihu, had different ideas. 
they offered something outside God's command. God had given them specific instructions. If you want to approach me, this is the way. But Aaron's two sons had different ideas. They offered strange fire or profane fire. And what happened to them? The fire came down and devoured them. When we worship God, when we come to approach Him, we come on God's terms. We do it on His terms. When we do things our way, God is going to deal with us severely. The punishment for Nadab and Abihu was death. Similarly, in Exodus 32, the golden story of the golden calf, Israel started worshipping an idol. They started worshipping a golden calf. And what was their punishment? God punished, punished them with death. Exodus 32 verse 28, about 3,000 men of the people fell that day. Acts chapter 5, Ananias and Sapphira lied to the Holy Spirit about their offerings. They lied about the price of their lands and what happened to them. God struck them dead. It is dangerous to offer God strange fire, profane fire in our worship. That's why when we come to worship Him on Sunday, we use what is called the regulative principle, which is we do what is only clearly commanded in Scripture or what is practiced in Scripture. We don't offer strange or profane fire to Him. And why do I highlight this? Because a lot of the charismatic churches have abused the worship of God and abused the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. And they abuse this verse, be filled with the Spirit. They have ascribed things that the Holy Spirit has not done and said. And when I watch some of those videos, I see horrendous things happening in the church where you have the pastor coming to the person and say, I, I call fire down from heaven and the person starts shaking all over, say, indicating that he, has, he or she has been filled with the Spirit. And then the, a, a, another video, the pastor is, is again proclaiming something or a person and the person starts laughing hysterically. In, again, indicating that they are filled with the Spirit. And in some churches, they are singing some, some songs to invoke their emotion. And they sing, they're leaving their hands up, indicating that the Holy Spirit has come down and, and influenced them. From the comparison that we have seen, from the verses that I have read, do you see any of such things? When someone is filled with the Holy Spirit, they are bold, they are courageous, they are meek, they are gentle. But somehow the charismatic churches, a lot of the charismatic churches have misused this verse to say that fear of the Spirit is something else. And they abuse their worship services. And they offer strange and profane fire to God every Sunday. Now it's, it's scary to know what will happen to them on Judgment Day. And it's amazing how much patience God has with them. Sunday after Sunday, profane and strange fire every week. Now, by God's mercy and grace, many of us have been protected from this false doctrine of strange fire, from abusing this verse being filled with the Spirit. But I fear that in our Reformed circles, even our Reformed Baptist circles, unfortunately, we fall, often fall to the second extreme. And there is no fire. We may not fall to the extreme of strange fire, but at times we do fall to the other extreme of no fire. Now what do I mean by no fire? I mean that there are Christians who are so spiritually dull. They are so spiritually dull in their Christian life. It's like they have quenched the spirit. It almost seems like they are like the non-believers, spiritually dead. That's what I mean by no fire at all in their lives. There are lots of Christians who just think that in life, I just want to have a, a family of my own. I want to get married. I want to have children. I want to have a, have a nice house. I want to have a nice, a good job, get promoted, earn enough money, retire, 
And that's the end of my life. Absolutely no zeal in their service to God. Their whole life has been centered on this world, trying to make their life proper and ordered, but no zeal when it comes to serving God. No zeal when it comes to their own devotional life. No zeal when it comes to their prayer life. I read from Revelation chapter 3, verse 16. You think God deals severely to those who offer profane fire? Look at how God deals with those who have no fire. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 16. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Now, it's a scary thing to be rejected by Christ on the last day. To think that you are a Christian, to think that you have everything right. But no zeal in your life. Christ said, I, because you are neither cold nor hot, because you are lukewarm, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. We must pray that there will be no lukewarm Christians in our midst. We must pray for zeal, that the Spirit may fill our lives, and that the graces may be evident in our lives. Zealous Christians are not necessarily the most eloquent. They are not necessarily always on the pulpit. They are not necessarily always the ones who are gifted in teaching or leading Bible studies. Zealous Christians may be the ones that come to church every, early every week to clean the church, make sure the place is clean. Zealous Christians may not be able to teach eloquently, but they still pray wholeheartedly for the church and they still join the church prayer meetings every week. They may not be sent out to do mission work, but they can make sure that the missionaries have sufficient. We need to pray for zealous Christians for whatever gifts that they have, that they will serve wholeheartedly and humbly even with the little gifts that they have. Our danger here is not, it's often not strange fire, but our danger here is the lack of zeal, lack of zealousness. Now there is a comforting verse in verse 19 of Revelation chapter 3, and that is, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, therefore be zealous and repent. Now if they are those among us who have no zeal to serve, in church, there are no zeal in their Christian life. It's a dull, mundane Christian life. Pray and repent. But Christ say, those I rebuke and chasten. Those I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. There is an invitation here to repent. There is still hope. Are you zealous to serve the Lord? Or have you lost your love for Christ? Are you filled with the Spirit or have you quenched the Spirit? If you have sinned, Christ says, be zealous and repent. And there is still hope for us. Let's close in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you, O Lord, that even from one verse in Ephesians 5, verse 18, there's much for us to learn, there's much for us to apply in our lives. And we pray that we will not be people who are dull in our walk with you. We pray that we will seek you fervently. May you keep us and help us to grow, O Lord. May you fill us with your Spirit. We pray, O Lord, that you fill each and every one of us by your Spirit, that we may grow spiritually. And we pray that we will seek to know your will through your Word. And may the Word of Christ dwell in our hearts every day. For all this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.